learned his lesson. He's above this now. He doesn't need to do it anymore. Why are you laughing while you say that shit? That's fucked up. You make me sound like the bad guy, then you laugh and giggle at him. You know he's got a hot mic on you right now, right? Oh, he's recorded right he's, now. He's recorded. Wow, this guy. He recorded all your negative evil villain shit. Before. Who, me you, or you? you. I, the listeners were DMing me on the side on your live right now saying, yeah. Chris is painting you and Odun out to be bad guys. I'm not painting you guys are, shit. You guys are intentionally running late. Bro, first of all, you sent me a text after you were already late. What time? Go ahead, check it. I don't I don't know. I was already in the live. I, I sent it to you at 8.40. I was already on the live. Mm -hmm. I'm broadcasting our brand. To help you. Our brand. So it was on the the Higher Standard Podcast brand? It was, yeah. It was sponsored by, yeah. Sponsored? <laughs> this guy. Well, it was it's sponsored great. by. It was oh, they really? were our brand oh, partner. Oh, we, the Higher Standard? They were the brand partner. My personal account has more followers than the podcast as oh, I'm trying doing, to cross oh, pollinate. Oh, you're doing us a favor now. Listen, man. This I'm is not a, hand, a handout. I made $12 last month on those lives. I'm <laughs> not sharing <laughs> shit with you now. <laughs> I don't think people understand I'm gonna, that. I'm going to keep that $12 in my pocket. Yeah, you are. I'll frame that bitch and say, Sayyid will never get this. <laughs> Terrible. All right. Well, welcome back to the number one financial literacy podcast in the world. Sitting next to me is my sassy but classy partner in time, the one and only Sayyid Omar. Sitting next to me is my partner in crime, Chris Nahibi. Welcome back to the show, everybody. Mm, behind the ones and twos, the man who put the thickness in a can. The only one. DJ. Come on. DJ Room. Oh, good man. DJ Room. What's up, Baldwin? Hello, boys. How you guys doing? Good. How you doing? Doing good. Doing good. Happy Monday. Happy Is Monday. Happy Monday. Nah. It's been a very mel melancholy Monday for me. I'm going to be honest with you. Nothing really. Yeah. So you I moved back into your new office. Yeah. Well, yeah, but I was reading the news, right? And I'm already like, I've seen a lot of visuals from the humanitarian crisis that I'm going to call the Israeli Palestinian conflict that's going on. And it's just fucked up. It, mm -hmm. The whole thing is just bad. I'm 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 going on like the daisy chain of like the information disinformation. I'm trying to parse together what I can from like everything, and you know, and I'm worried about the economic impacts of your country with the Ukraine war. I'm worried about how us deploying aircraft carriers to the region from just a pure economic perspective is going to impact the United States in a recessionary economy. And I'm trying to think about the show and what we do here for a living. And then I see the U.S. has now sent fucking B-52 bombers to South Korea. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't catch that one. As a warning shot across the bow to North Korea if they amplify their nuclear programs. Like, now's the time for this? Like, uh, did anybody get the memo? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we almost had a government shutdown last month because they didn't understand what to do with the budget. And no one gives a shit. Yeah, but now all of a sudden we have all this extra money to deploy? Wow. <laughs> I just thought this is a lot like my credit card conversations at home. <laughs> 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 Baby, why are you deploying more capital? There's a war going on here. Listen, man, she's running a household. What are you doing? No, I know, I know, I know. And it, I'm, I'm a good. We had a great trip to Hawaii. Why are you stuttering? I'm, <laughs> uh, <laughs> <He's trying> to, <laughs> I'm like shit. Wait, <laughs> Chris, you're sweating. No, no, I'm not sweating. But uh, yeah, look, all I'm saying is the United States should not be, should be much more thoughtful in its spending, and we seem to be spending on everything. And anything under the auspice of supporting our allies, and there there is a correlation to wars and recessions. Actually, you know what, Arun? Before we get, get into the show, like synopsis, uh, Google uh, wars and recession, just to see what the if there's a correlation between wars and recession. I guarantee you that there is an economic um, wars and recession, not in recession. That's awkward. Wars. In How does war? Wars what are you, during, what are you typing war, here? Wars during a recession. Recessionary economies. Recessions, that's fine. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I mean, you would have to imagine, right, with all the geopolitical uncertainty and instability, that something's going to have to happen with oil prices and gas prices. Oh, 100%. Which and that in and of itself is going to have rippling effects. If inflation is a risk during a war, recession is another risk at the end of it. The massive expansion in production to provide resources for the war effort if suddenly contracted by the cancellation of all defense contracts, throws large numbers of people out of work. Well, that's just people out of work. That's something that the Fed's aiming to do. So, The Second World War was followed by the Great Depression of 1929 through 1939, the single worst depressionary slash recessionary economy we've ever had in, in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, the early 1990s recession, again, uh, put the U.S. Uh, on the war front again uh, against Iraq. 
history shows that most of the wars have followed uh, the economic have been followed by the economic crisis. There are very few occasions when we're uh, when world face sh uh, slowdowns or recessions after the wars. But yeah, that was a. Really I mean, it makes sense. it makes sense, right? You you can see how after after a time like that where all, all this money is being spent that you did not you know allocate for. You're you're not having to deploy out to other we, things. We had economic problems before we started spending more. For, I mean, my whole my whole thing is like my Monday got fucked up because I went down this like rabbit hole, and I'm trying to like think about okay, how does this all impact the economics? And then more I'm thinking about it, I'm more like this is all fucked up. Mm -hmm. And now I'm at a point now where I'm like, okay, like how much of this is information versus disinformation leading into an election year in the United States in November? Because wartime presidents almost always get reelected, mm. and I'm like, well, fuck. I mean, is there like I'm I don't want to put the tinfoil hat on and be that guy, but I'm like. Some of these visuals are just incredibly, like, it's a humanitarian crisis. Right. Anyway. During a time where we already know that the Fed's already planning to hold rates higher for longer. Yeah. So, I mean, there, there's just so many things. And I'm going like, okay, something's going to crack. And, I mean, some of the stuff we'll go over in tonight's show, talk about the economic impacts of what we've seen play out so far. And some of the data that we're seeing is traditional lagging indicators, particularly the housing and rental markets, rent and rent equivalent, if you're looking under the inflation categories. But, mm -hmm. So we'll cover tonight on the show. Uh, mortgage cost surge makes it cheaper to rent in tough United States markets. Um, think Southern California. Think Miami. Think Austin. Mm -hmm. Right? These markets are wildly out of out of proportion as far as rents versus ownership. It, Sun Belt region, right? Sun Belt region, especially the high end luxury properties. And we're going to put some real context into what that looks like for those of you who don't know. We'll talk about Austin specifically. There's 120,000 apartments in the pipeline, and they already have a pretty notable amount that are vacant currently. Mm -hmm. We'll move to some of the nation's top colleges, uh, which are eliminating student loans. We talked about that two years ago uh, on the show when we talked about endowments of some of these large schools being so massive, they're making way more money off that than they are actually charging tuition. Yes. Well, our prediction came true, and we'll break down what that looks like. And some of the names on that list are impressive and well-known and respected schools. Miami's rental market roller coaster is headed downhill. Uh, we called that on the show because uh, I think when I went to Naples, I landed in Miami, drove from Miami to Naples, and the amount of cranes coming out of there was just, it looked unsustainable. I mean, there was just too many properties being put up. Right. Uh, and then multifamily mentor Brad Some Rock, also known as Piece of Shit. Or uh, the Apartment King. Yeah, or the Apartment King slash Piece of Shit, or is it Piece of Shit <laughs> yeah. slash Apartment Depends King? how much can, can fit on his license plate. Yeah. I'm sure there's a P O S A K. Yeah, maybe. Posack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he built an empire. Now the cracks are showing. And then there's several topics I'm going to branch out uh, from that. One of which uh, was a similar situation with uh, Baller Busters busting or noting the bust of DJ Envy, who supported somebody similar in a syndication structure, which we'll get into if there's time. Yeah, man. I actually saw his like explanation of it too. Um, on the Breakfast Club, it was. It, I felt like, come on, man. Well, there's text messages keep, that come out since then, like totally incriminating his. Like, I didn't know bullshit. Yeah, man. Just keep your mouth. I'm sure his attorneys told him to stop talking. No, he said it. He's like, my attorneys don't want me to talk, and I'm like, this, this right here, this is why. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Everything you said right now. Yeah. That's why. This is a bad look for you. Yeah. This is this is probably of uh, the top ten worst things you could do. Is probably number one. Yeah. It's probably yeah. why Angela Yee left the show. You probably don't know nothing about that. because you know, I know absolutely nothing about yeah, that. She was the third host that uh, grew that platform. Oh, that's right. She left? Yeah, she has her own like spinoff show now. What was that? <laughs> Did you dip your finger in it or something? What was? <laughs> that was the pop. That was a very uncharacteristic. That didn't sound like a Red Bull or a Monster. Yeah, did you use your hand to open that or something yeah, that else? That sounded like a Snapple. Yeah, did you, did you pop a Snapple? Yeah. No, I fucked up. I you didn't know juice? I unmuted myself. Oh, what? No, I didn't. That, that sounds. It's a little rusty. Oh, I didn't mute myself. Or I was muted, sorry. Did you use a butt to open it? God. <laughs> this guy's backpedaling. He's backpedaling. It was muffled by the butt. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think we should just leave that there. It's called a wrap. The show's yeah. over. <laughs> Said and I just listened to a rune open a snapple with his ass. <laughs> All right. So according to Bloomberg, mortgage cost surge makes it cheaper to rent in tough U.S. markets. Mm. It's getting even harder to find an affordable house. That should come as no surprise to anybody who listens to the show. In high-cost U.S. housing markets, including Los Angeles, Honolulu, Seattle, San Jose, 
and San Francisco, the premium for buying versus renting is surging, according to Zillow. And for those of you listening to the show, you know we are not exactly fans of Zillow's data. But in this particular instance, Zillow is often right when they come to quoting what rental rates are. And the reason why is what people want to list for rent or properties for rent in their area makes their, their data and their syndication platform pretty easy. So it's not as manipulated as home price in my mind. Right. That being said, in California, uh, San Jose market area, we've talked about many times on the show, for instance, where the typical home costs $1.4 million. Jeez. Yikes. I don't, what's the draw, man? A buyer with 10% down faces a monthly mortgage payment of approximately $8,771, more than $5,000 higher than monthly rent. Wow. So, uh, yeah, good place to rent, huh? Yeah, $5,000 more a month than renting. Mm. That is um, that is a swift kick in the ding-ding. Stop right there, Arun. Across the U.S., monthly rent was $81 cheaper in August than the monthly mortgage payment on a house for a sale with a 30-year mortgage, assuming 10% down and a 7.18% interest rate on a house listed for about $350,000. Right. That's the biggest gap nationally in data going back to 2015 with soaring borrowing costs making it more expensive to purchase a home even before taking into account taxes, insurance, and maintenance costs. Yeah, man. So Redfin actually did a deep dive analysis on this too, mm-hmm. and they measured like the top 50 you know, largest metropolitan area cities across the U.S. Yeah. And they said of, of those 50, there's only four of them where it's still cheaper to own than it is to rent. And those four were Detroit, Philadelphia, Cleveland, and Houston. Um, wow, okay. Houston was kind of a surprise. The rest of them make sense to me. <clears throat> yeah, and I think that's the age-old question, right? A lot of people, over, especially give, over the last, like, 14 years, that people are constantly wondering, I don't want to rent because I feel like I'm wasting my money. I'd rather own because I, I don't want to just throw my money away. I want to own something and build equity into a home. But I think what a lot of people tend to do is they just go, I think now Zillow has really popularized this, where you can go on Zillow mm-hmm. and look up houses for rent, and you see how much the house is renting for that's valued at $400,000, $500,000, or a house that you would probably see your family living in. And then if you go and look for the houses that are for sale, it, it just gives you a rough estimate of what that monthly mortgage would be, and we, and they compare the two. But there's a lot more that goes into it than just comparing what, the rent is, and what your potential mortgage payment would be. Yeah, so Arun's got a chart pulled up here. Uh, Buy versus rent math. The monthly mortgage payment on typical U.S. homes are more expensive than rent, and it really has two lines on it. One is median rent, and the second is mortgage payment with 10% down. That number has spiked up twice uh, in the last mm, eight years above the median rent number, and that was just after 2022 and just after 2023, where we are currently today. So this kind of goes hand in hand with the affordability crisis that we have going on right now. We're now at unprecedented affordability. But for context, I think it's good to give a bit of a perspective, at least my perspective, and side and ruin, feel free to chime in if you feel this way. Generally speaking, the advice that I give most people is... You should look to buy when you can put enough money down that your mortgage payment, your principal interest, taxes and insurance, okay, including impounds for taxes and insurance, which takes your taxes and insurance payment for the year and divides it by 12 and adds that to your monthly mortgage payment. So you're paying principal and interest on your loan plus one-twelfth of your total tax and insurance due for the year. Right. That's a service that your lender most likely provides. Or requires for or, that matter. Yeah, they yeah. may require depending on your financial position where you're, they'll divide up your taxes across the year and they'll hold it for you and you pay towards that account every month. And when that payment comes due, they'll make the payment for you. Yeah. It basically guarantees that you're making your tax payments and your insurance payments. But that being said, your PITI, I generally advise people when your principal interest taxes and insurance, whatever money you put down is equal to or lower than your rent payment. That's a good time for you to buy. Mm-hmm. Now, this scenario presumes 10% down, and that's probably in line with the maximum that most people can get to because home prices are so goddamn high. Inflation is so goddamn high. It's hard to save. Most people's savings from the pandemic era, stimulus, PPP, all these things have now, as we talked about on the show, gone away. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, 10% is probably an optimistic view of how much people can put down. 
but we're so out of whack that if you put 10% down in, in, in the average there in the market that we just talked about in San Jose, mm -hmm. you're still spending $5,000 more, which means your cash flow is $5,000 a month better for the same home by not buying. You can save, put in your pocket $5,000 every single month. My advice to that person is, look, that's $60,000 a year you can save and put in your pocket by renting versus not buying right now. Well, Chris, I'm missing out on the equity upside. No, you're not. If you believe, like we believe, that home values have room to go down, the only possible thing that can happen to you at this point in time is you could lose equity. Mm -hmm. Meaning, let's say you put 10% down on a home, you buy a home, you're now making $8,000 a month payments versus your $3,000 from change a month payments, right? Well, guess what? That property goes down 10% in value. You are now underwater on that property. And if you sold it, you have to take an economic loss to get out of those payments. Right. And that's one of the, so that's one of the benefits that you have. Whereas if, if you were rent, you don't have that, that necessarily to worry about. Right. Right. Um, but another benefit um, that you have for rent or actually a con to renting is you don't necessarily hold, you know, your future is your future isn't locked in the price that you're paying monthly. Right. Especially if you're renting a house. Right. Because if you're living in a place where there is something like rent control, rent control doesn't really imp doesn't help you out there. If you're renting a home, they can jack up the rent on you, at least in Los Angeles or in California. That's the case. Mm. Um, I don't know places across the country, everywhere else, but I know personally from a few friends that this has happened to them. Um, another factor that you want to consider, and we talked about it. Right. But just to give you some numbers to think about is when you're comparing, you know, those mortgage prices to whatever the rents are. On a, on a, you know, your median sale price of a home right now is $400,000, you know, taxes on that in, in the state of like California, that's $5,000 a year. That's an extra $400 a month. Yeah. Right. So now add $400 a month to whatever that estimate mortgage payment is. Also now factor in your insurance costs. Insurance costs are also going up. We've talked about it in places like California and in Florida. They're going up. Premiums are staring at my hair on my knuckles. No, I was looking at your sweater. Thinking to myself, like, for the amount of body fat that you carry around, plus wearing a sweater, a hat, pants right now, you must be a little toasty. Some of us stay cool all the time, baby. Okay. We got the AC blasting in here. It is It is blasting, but I am um, I am still on the warm side. Are you really? Yeah. Hmm. Feeling extra hot. Okay. But other other costs that people need to be considering, um, if, you're, if you're thinking about if you're ready to buy a home or not, is, I mean, there's things like repairing your house right repair and maintenance dude, there unless your house was built relatively new and there are a lot of people buying new new homes mm -hmm. the the beauty in renting people really we've devalued renting yeah but there's a lot of benefits to it if you rent something goes wrong you call your landlord and say hey my toilet uh, it sucks fix it they, they have to fix it mm -hmm. you know you uh you want someone if you trust your landlord they can come in while you're not there Fix property while you're at work. If you own the home, you're not going to let somebody in your house to fix your stuff while you're not there. Right. You know, you're not going to, you, you have to pay for that out of pocket. Now you got to worry mm -hmm. about the cost of repairs. What if your air conditioning goes out? What if your water heater goes out? You can't just call your landlord and have them take care of it. It's significantly more difficult to be a, a homeowner than it is to be a landlord when it comes to maintenance. Right. And then the other factor to consider here is affordability right now is that a, it afford, the disparity in affordability is at an all time high. Right. And that's something that I'd be really concerned about, given the fact where we are in our current state of the economy. Right. What the Fed is trying to accomplish by bringing down stopping wage inflation. Right. And what could that ultimately do to the uh, values of homes? If if we're projecting home values to come down another 10 to 15 percent, that would worry me a little bit. If we're projecting and the Fed is projecting unemployment is going to go up. That would worry me a little bit. Is now the right time for me to really dive in and buy a home? Because back in the day, the rule of thumb was you should own your home for at least five years before considering selling it so you build up some equity, right? Yeah. Nowadays, with where interest rates are because of the way interest rates work, that number is probably looking more like seven years, right, to build a more, to build a more equity, maybe seven, maybe eight years. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's a possibility, but... Because more of your money, for people that don't, that don't understand why, more of your money is now going towards interest. Yeah. Than than the actual equity of the home. So if you're if you're not certain whether you want to continue living in that area for at least another seven years, then 
Because that's the other factor, right? We're talking about a scenario where there's a 10% down payment. Well, if you're not planning on living there for seven years, what could that 10% down payment, what could that be earning you in some other form of an investment? Yeah, so Arun pulled this up from Forbes, which questionable source in general, but the na nationwide average down payment for a house is 14.4%. So maybe 10% in this case is probably a valid number for, for an example versus rent. The average median of $32,248. During the second quarter of 2023, reports Hannah Jones, an economic data analyst at Realtor.com. In the second quarter of 2023, Louisiana home buyers made the lowest average down payment of approximately 9.2% at $6,729, while Washington, D.C. has the highest down payment percentage at about 20.4%, with a $100,800 median down payment due to the area's obviously expensive housing market. Jeez, man. So obviously, with some of those down payments, anything below 20%, that's another expense that you need to be factoring in is your PMI payment. Right. Yeah. And then the last one that everyone needs to consider is whether you're living in an area that has HOA or doesn't have HOA, then you got to consider a landscaping bill every month. Right. To maintain, you know, your house a little bit. If you don't have if you don't have much landscaping, but you do have an HOA, like how much is your HOA right now? I actually have two. I have a master and a sub uh, mm -hmm. HOA. I think in aggregate, it's around 300 bucks a month. Around 300. So that's another $300 expense on top of it. So yeah. so. The point being is you can't just look at Zillow and see what that monthly mortgage payment would be and just compare that to rents, right? So in, in this scenario right now, it sounds like renting is, is a better option for most people. And I know that comes with a lot of sensationalism because everything you read about and listen to and see on social media and the internet suggests that always buy, always buy, buy now. You got to buy now, you know, that whole thing. And um, I don't know that buying now would be sound in reasonable advice. I think right now holding cash and being thoughtful and pragmatic about where you go next is a better and wiser decision. Mm -hmm. uh, there are people who would disagree with that. I recognize, but they're wrong. So don't <laughs> listen to them. Okay. <laughs> and uh, to give you an example as to why I think uh, renting might be the better choice, let's talk about a little article from The Real Deal. Love The Real Deal. The Real Deal is the real deal. Yeah, I mean, that is a sexy. Although name. they did publish a Grant Cardone story, which was quite, so they said that Grant Cardone was left off the hook of another class action lawsuit. Yeah, but the underlying connotation was that Grant Cardone won. What they didn't talk about was, at least not in my mind, in enough detail, was that um, the woman who was suing on behalf of the class action as the representative of the class was suing on behalf of her deceased father. Mm -hmm. So she didn't couldn't make a compelling enough nexus that she had the rights to sue on his behalf. I see. Which I would argue is probably not a good litmus test for whether or not Grant Cardone is a piece of shit or not. <laughs> yeah. I'm just I'm just saying, just because you can get through a lawsuit, and I'll say this for the record, okay? And I know recognize I'm an attorney and I'm bashing myself. The law is not fair. It's supposed to be fair. It's supposed to work that way in theory. It's supposed to be good guy wins, bad guy loses. That ain't the way this shit works. Nine times out of ten, it's the guy with the most, as much money and as much time on their hands that can afford to spend money and go like the long game that wins. Oh, the deeper pocket. Right? So think of it as like a, a poker game, right? You know, whoever can come to the table with the most chips and can outlast whoever everyone else on the table. Yeah, and it's no different than going all in, count as chips. <laughs> Yeah. You know what I mean? It's, it's the not, most derogatory thing you can how, do. That's, that's not how it works. I can cover it. You're good. No, no, no. I want you to count them. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes my pocket twos might win this bitch. <laughs> not today. And certainly not if you live in Austin. Austin has over 120,000 apartments in the pipeline, but landlords may struggle to fill them. Why, may you ask? Well, I'm happy to explain. Mm. Apartment developers and developments are sprouting up all over Austin, but there might not be enough renters to fill all of them. The Lone Star State Capital has more than 120,000 multifamily units in the development pipeline with over 15,000 apartments already delivered this year alone in 2023. Well, while the influx of supply helped stabilize soaring rents, dropping from an average monthly rate of $1,622 in 2022 to $1,594 in 2023, developers are now facing a challenge of higher vacancy rates. There are roughly 36,000 units right now, today, vacant in the multifamily space in the Austin major metropolitan area, a number that could potentially increase dramatically when those 120,000 units in the pipeline come online in the coming months when demand typically wanes. So I definitely, you definitely see 
asking rents coming down in this market, right? In, in yeah. this in this region. And, oh, yeah. and here's and here's the problem for some of these for some of these people, right? When these deals get underwritten, man, it's just going to be a wave of bad news for these land landlords, right? Oh yeah, the property owners that they are, dude. First of all, if you got a construction loan. Oh, don't even get me started, right? And your your construction loan was the way this works. Just just so you know, right, is they put together a basically a budget, a a cost, right? Of what they have cost valid third party cost validation to make sure all the budgets there, right? They have a fund control, generally speaking, where they're going to fund their portion of money that's put in the project, and the bank will fund theirs after your money is depleted. There's a construction reserve for cost overruns, things like that. But they, they monitor, make sure that your project is on track, and they'll disperse funds from the fund control once you've hit certain milestones, like is the framing up, is the electrician electrical and plumbing in, and it varies slightly from state to state. But generally speaking, they'll hit certain milestones, and they'll disperse money to pay your contractors and subcontractors. Right, and af after the, the permits have been signed off on. Correct. But this whole thing is predicated on it being underwritten the very, 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 very beginning when they do a market analysis and they get an appraisal as completed appraisal. What will this property appraise for as completed? Mm -hmm. And a lot of these as completed appraisals took into the context of what can we rent this for? And what do they look at? They look at comparables in the area. Yeah. Right. Which 18 months ago when construction started before presumptively at least, mm, let's call it 15, maybe 16,000 units this year came online. And 120,000 in the pipeline behind it, that number is going to be higher in underwriting 18 months ago than it is now today because rental rates are going down. Matter of fact, you heard an incremental decrease already in the, in the quote that I read you from $1,622 down to $1,594. That's not a lot of money to you, but when you when you hear that you take, let's say, $1,622, $1,594, it's called $28 per unit, mm -hmm. right? Let's just say it goes down $100 per unit. And let's just say you've got a 50-unit apartment building. 100 times 50, 5,000. Right. Right? $5,000 less in monthly income for the landlord translates to a pretty significant drop in loan funds. Yeah, and your yeah your loan's going to have to get cut, ultimately meaning they're going to need to come up with more liquidity up front. Another issue that a lot of these real estate investors, we've talked about this on the show before, that these guys are, they don't really carry a lot of liquidity, Right. No, but they are certainly the B builders, uh, the National Association of Home Builders, and the builders in general post Great Recession. They got kicked really hard in the ding ding mm -hmm. during the Great Recession because they built all this stuff with the idea that home values were only going to go up and they didn't have a cushion. They're a lot better positioned today for any kind of economic downturn, but there are problems where if you're a professional builder for a living and you're running a company and you have things like liquidity as reserve just in case. That's a wildly different scenario than something we're seeing much more common. We've talked about it on several shows. We're going to talk about it later in this show. Syndications. Yeah. A syndication structure is different in sight. If you care to explain, I'll get into why. A uh, syndication structure is basically there's somebody that's looking for a bunch of real estate investors to come in and invest a certain portion of their money. And they all, all the, there's sometimes there'll be different classes or mm -hmm. class A members, class B members, and they'll invest and they'll own a certain a small percentage. And the person that's putting this deal together will sometimes collect a fee and they'll be the manager of that syndication. And it helps them ultimately gather the funds like crowdfunding in order to fund the deal, if you will. And there are a number of previous episodes we've covered syndications in detail. I think there actually is a full syndication episode in our early days, about a year and a half, two years ago, if you want to look for that. That being said, the problem with a lot of syndicators today is they are younger and more ambitious if they've been involved in real estate the last 14 years, they might be feeling all high and mighty about how many times they've done this, but they haven't lived through a recessionary economy. Mm -hmm. Few syndicators actually have multi-decade experience that you can readily find on social media. Why? If you're really good at your job, you don't need to advertise. Think Warren Buffett. <laughs> Warren Buffett doesn't need to say, hey, I need, I need more investors. Who wants to, can you want, come invest invest me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let me get on Sirius XM Radio and advertise my services. There's no, there's no, he doesn't need to do that. Right. People come to him because they know his returns outsize any risk that they're going to take on. Exactly. They're begging to go to him. Unlike Grant Cardone, for example, who was a former car salesman who taught courses, who became this online sensationalized personality. And look who, at the demographic that he's targeting. Yeah. A less sophisticated demographic who may have a little bit of a taste of it, but all they want is wealth for the and, most part. And really what these charlatans, if you will, what they're really jumping on is whatever's the latest, trendiest thing, right? Yeah. 
There's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. And, and over the last like couple of years, it's been invest in real estate. Real estate's the way to go. That's the way to make money. And they oversimplify. Everything is yeah. always oversimplified. And we're going to get into it a little bit later on the show. But what I was talking about, about them not carrying a lot of liquidity, was not those in the construction space, but just real estate investors in general, right? Yeah, yeah. So, and with uh, more units coming online, what these guys typically do, based on the deals that I've looked at over the last 10 years, right? during all the, the, the good times, if you will, is they like to stretch out that loan as much as they possibly can. And mm -hmm. a lot of times they're pulling out their equity from that property to go buy another property, right? Yeah, yeah. So what that means is those deals were under into a certain amount of vacancy number, okay? Now with more units coming online and rents having to come down, right? Those properties that they they basically stretched out as thin as possible. They're not going to be generating as much income. And on top of that, they're going to be having more vacancies to deal with. Well, and then you start thinking about it in the context of if, if you brought this apartment unit to market and you try to pre-lease it and get it leased out, and now you've got to pay off your construction loan with the loan, a permanent loan, and they're not going to give you 100% financing. They're going to give no. you financing based on the cash flow of the property. And if the property doesn't cash flow as much, mm -hmm. you're going to have to come up with extra money to bring in to close that deal or you're going to have to sell the property. Right. And then what does this mean for everyone else, like uh, our listeners? If you're not in, you don't have the funds to invest in real estate, you can look for your rents to come down, right? But these things, like when the rents do come down, it's not going to affect inflation until they report. Right. And that takes about six months yep. or so for them to report. And that's why the Fed has now come out and said that they don't see themselves hitting that 2% target range till the end of 2025, maybe even bleeding into 2026. I feel like that, that's an exaggeration, though. I, I honestly do feel like they might, they might not hit it, but you can expect them to cut leading up to it. I just don't yes. know. And nobody knows, are they going to cut the same way they raise rates with this weird bell-shaped curve where they went 25, 50, 75, 75, 75, 50, 25. I think they'll definitely be a little bit more careful, right? Because given the fact that they're, they've are they they've cited that they're afraid of the resurgence in inflation. It would be a total scumbag move to cut 25 basis points every single time to cut us back down. But I fully yeah. expect that to be a possibility. Yeah, it's, and so do I. Um, so I guess it remains to be seen. Well, and I also think that this Austin is one example of many. It's a microcosm of what I think is going to happen in a lot of major metro, metropolitan areas. Miami is another great example. I think the number of high-end construction units being brought to these markets, is just untenable. It's unsustainable, right? Mm -hmm. People are going to say, okay, look, again, we talked about some previous shows. Do I need the granite, counter, granite countertops or can I go with tile? Do I need the high-end fancy in-building gym? Do I need the dog park? Or can I sacrifice those amenities to go live somewhere else where I don't have them, but I pay less? Right. And I think people will ultimately wind up doing that. It's where I think workforce housing, your 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 lower middle income properties are going to do a lot better than some of these high end properties. They were banking on the ideology that home values are so out of reach, but people want this premium experience and they have all this excess cash flow. Well, the excess cash flow is gone. That's already happened. Mm -hmm. And if home values start to come back the other way, it's just going to cause it's going to take this problem and blow it up. But there are still, I mean, there are markets, and I'm sure many of you who have DM'd me over the last couple of months have can, can name some in your own. But I have been to major markets recently where I've just seen construction cranes everywhere. And certainly Miami, Austin, a number of other places, uh, San Francisco, have all stood out to me as places that have been overdeveloped in this particular space. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the next article is an interesting well, one. Well, I actually had a question for you, Chris. Ooh, like, no questions. Ooh, too bad. Yeah, yeah suck it up. Sorry. You're going to have to answer this question. Um, how might the oversupply of apartment units in Austin, Miami, these other cities that you keep talking about, like, impact the housing market in terms of, like, prices and, like, rental yields? Like, Well, so it, it's kind of like a, well, two parts to, to that answering that question. Part number one is as rental rates for similarly situated properties go down, It'll be because similarly situated units for apartments go down. But I look at them as split demographics. It depends on where you're at, right? A family in the Midwest is generally going to want to rent a home because they get more land. The land is more important to them. They want a backyard. They want dogs. They want privacy. It's a bit of a different kind of conundrum. In New York and Miami, where there's a lot more vertical properties, I think the demographic is a lot more different there as well. So I think you have to kind of separate those out. In major metropolitan areas like Miami and Austin, I think what you're going to wind up seeing is is as property values come down, 
And as these rental rates start to come down at a, at a faster cadence, you're going to wind up getting people to say, okay, now it's, it's probably a better idea for me to buy. I've been able to save all this money, not running as much. Or it'll put downward pressure on the rental rates. I think what you're going to have to happen is downward pressure will continue to happen on rental rates until home values come down. When home values come down, then you're going to start to see a, a balance of an equilibrium of sorts of, of, of supply and demand in the market. But mm -hmm. that's purely speculation. Right now, there is no visible... There, there is no visible catalyst to, to resolve the supply demand issue. And until there's more properties trading on the market, you can't get home values to go down. At the same time, rental rates are already creeping down this early in the game. Expect them to go down much faster in the coming, call it six months to a year. Yeah. It, it's kind of a roundabout way to answer your question. The short answer is, is a lot of this is unprecedented with how, how widely out of balance we are. The affordability crisis has never been this bad. So will that ultimately bring, you know, home values down? In theory, they need to come down either way. There'll be other pressures, but will it bring rents down on homes? Absolutely. You're already seeing that. Because mm -hmm. people are going to be more competitive because they're competing against these apartment supply units, right? Not, and not only that, remember, we talked about before that the loans that people have on their homes are so low, they're going to do everything they can to keep their homes. So they're more likely to rent their home out yeah. than to sell their home. Which is a big problem in the market right now, which causes the supply-demand challenge. Arun, does that answer your, your question? Yeah, it did. We're going to get back to homes in a little bit on a different topic. But before then, we'll take a little, little intermission, if we will. Mm. Uh, according to CNBC, some of the nation's top colleges are eliminating student loans. And I fucking loved this article. Not only because it proved that we were right. Not only because it's a good thing for the students. But because Jessica Dickler wrote it. <laughs> She's back. She's back, baby. Dang, look My at girl her. girl Dickler coming back two for two. J.D. J. Dickler. Hey. <laughs> I got to send her an email. <laughs> Listen, I love your content and your name. And <laughs> she probably gets that. Is your brother Dirk? <laughs> <laughs> I, love, I love this article because it plays into the favor of our kids. It does. Well... In particular, uh, it, it it really sets, I think, in my mind, at first I was like, meh, whatever. But the names that are associated with this, and we'll read the list uh, shortly, the names that are associated with this are so powerful that I do think this will influence the rest of the structure. So as a way of setting this kind of context up, one of the things that Saeed and I talk, talked about a year and a half, maybe a little longer than that about, was that some of these schools like Texas, um, Yale, MIT, uh, Harvard, Princeton, they had such massive endowment funds. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who aren't clear on what endowment funds are, generally speaking, as a school, you put these people through your program, and then you hope that they become dedicated boosters who support the school by giving back, large donations. Yeah, the alumni just giving back to the school because they want either their kids to get accepted yeah. later or just because they appreciate everything they've done for them. And I am one of those scumbags. I'll be the first to admit. I've donated a lot of money to hey, Yale. it's part of the game, man. It, it's part of the game. Now, at first, I didn't understand why they had an executive program that enabled me to go to Yale. And then the light bulb went on. Instead of betting on students becoming successful, and not all of them become successful financially, they can donate. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure there's, you know, it varies on school and everything else. But the loyalty that you can instill in these students is really a part of that nexus. How closely do they feel attached to your school? Mm. If you go on for a graduate program, are you still going to feel attached to it? If you go on to a, you know, a, a successful career, you're going to be more attached to your career than you are your alma mater. Like well, some people just don't really care. I mean, it really depends entirely. But why bet on students when you can get successful entrepreneurs that come to your program? Mm -hmm. Then I looked at the, the resume in order to get into the program that I went to, and I'm like, son of a bitch. Executive at a publicly traded company, you have to be unique, and you have to have a C-level position or higher. Mm. And I'm like, oh, my God. Right. Rather than me going to the program and wondering if I'm dedicated and I'll, I'll donate, they, they bring people on that they know are going to donate, and they're like, you want to be alumni? We'll hook you up. Right. That's, makes sense. I mean, that's a long story short of what happened with me, mm -hmm. but the programs make sense. But because in the case for me personally, I've never donated to the college that I went to. Yeah. You know, and I, I probably never will, but I don't know if I, I would, if maybe I did a master's program there, maybe. I doubt it. Yeah. I mean, at that point in time. Yeah. And, and my whole thought process on the kids going to school is ultimately like, I want you to do whatever you want to do. You don't have to go to my alma mater. Well, in the case of some of these larger schools, they've been around the longest in the cases of Yale and Harvard, right? Mm -hmm. But some of them just have incredible loyalty. Think uh, Texas, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so they've built these multi-billion dollar endowment funds. And the returns they've been able to continue to generate year after year have way outpaced 
the tuition that they're getting from the students. Mm -hmm. Where we made the case in, in about a year and a half ago, the tuition they were getting from students was essentially a non, like a non impact for them at this point financially. Well, yeah, for most of them, right? It, it was so inconsequential to their bottom line that we 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 asked the question, why are they even getting them? And some schools were tossed around the idea of like, okay, if we don't take anybody's money, we can fucking pick whoever we want. Right. Well. In the wake of the battle over student loan forgiveness, a growing number of colleges are eliminating educational debt entirely from the outset. Roughly two dozen schools have now, quote, no loan and, quote, policies, which means they will meet 100% of an undergraduate's needs for financial aid with grants rather than student loans. Uh, and I'm, that's that's a pretty compelling set of situations. So colleges and universities that fully meet Students calculated financial needs without loans. I'm going to go through a high-level uh, list. Not all of them, obviously. Mm -hmm. Brown University, great wow. school. Dartmouth College, great school. Duke University, <laughs> Harvard College, Massachusetts Institution, uh, Institute of Technology, MIT. Princeton. Pomona College in Claremont. Princeton, yeah. Yale. Yeah, University of Pennsylvania, Yale. Vassar College. I mean, these are big names. Yeah. Williams College. So remember, these schools are not funded by the government, men. So in order for them to even be able to provide something like this with grants, right, from the school through their endowments, how much money are they making to where they could just wipe away the same type of college debt that handcuffs these kids for their entire lifetime? Mm -hmm. Think about that for a second. So let's, let's go back here to that paragraph up there. There, it's up right there. At Lafayette, families with household, household incomes of up to $200,000 have their financial needs met through grants and work study without any loans. Here's a quote from the article. We have a moral obligation to make sure our low and moderate income families know that college is the best investment you'll make in yourself, Heard said. What now, was that, what was that moral obligation the last... Well, <laughs> 10 years, dude, 20 years. You may or may not have caught, and there's another quote, uh, college is expensive and we have to make sure we keep it accessible, said Nicole Hurd, president of Lafayette College in Eastern Pennsylvania. So here, here's my thought, is there, there was something very subtle there, which almost alludes to the concern that we've had in the housing market and plays back into the conversation. People are saying, well, Chris, why are you talking about student loan debt? This is cool and all, but why are we talking about this in the middle of this real estate episode and you know, mm -hmm. renting and buying? One of the biggest concerns that we've had on the show has been if people cannot buy a home and homes are generally speaking where most people build their wealth, even though it shouldn't be your primary investment, it's where most people build the, the source of their net worth and the equity in their home over time. If you can't buy a home, you can't build equity over time. That means we have been concerned that we see a widening of the lower class versus the upper class with a very small and diminishing middle class. And if you'll notice, these programs are built, in this instance, for both the low class and the middle class right. middle class applicants because they recognize the problem. Right. Now, they're, these people also need to start getting grouped in. Exactly. They're grouping the middle class and the lower class in already to those who need this degree of financial aid. Or historically, they, I mean, keep in mind, school has gotten way more fucking expensive than it once was. Mm -hmm. And with inflation and everything else going on, like all of this is a great thing for the students. Right. But what worries me is the fact that we're already lumping effectively into two classes. Right. You've got the lower middle class and you've got the upper class and that's it. And that's it. And that's it. Families that are making combined income of 200000 $200, Two hundred thousand dollars before, yeah. before I mean, back in the day, it would have to have been like low income families. Yeah, right. And even then, you wouldn't get one hundred percent coverage. Right. Yeah, you, you'd be lucky to get one hundred percent coverage. Yeah. So it's been interesting. And so one of these Colby College in Water uh, Waterville, Maine, has had a no loan policy in place since two thousand and eight. I respect that. That's that's that's, I mean, that's such a, so such an amazing thing for a kid. I had one hundred and twenty five, hundred twenty six thousand dollars student debt when I got out of college. Undergraduate. Uh, no combined. Oh, okay. Undergraduate, undergrad. I paid for some of it out of pocket. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, I, I had a lot. So, and that that had I not have been extremely lucky and fortunate to find the jobs and be in the positions that I was in, I that that could have really hamstrung me. My student loan payment when I first got out of college was like twelve hundred bucks a month. Right. And when you're making not that much money, that's a fucking ton of money. Right, man. My yeah. rent at the time was fourteen forty four or yeah, something. Yeah. Like kids nowadays are getting uh, they're doing a cost benefit analysis, you know, including their student loans to see yeah. if it's even worth me going to school. This is something that, that they would need and makes me excited for our kids in the future. 
It does. It makes me excited. I, I want to see more colleges adopt this methodology. Now, I do think that's going to give them room to be considerably more picky with who they let in. Mm -hmm. And I do think it'll be interesting to see how the college admissions process changes because now they're saying we're betting on you yeah. entirely. Right. So, and if you're a kid and you go, and can you imagine your parent? You're not even fucking paying for this shit, Troy. Yeah, come on. <laughs> Why <Mike>, Troy? <laughs> <laughs> But the thing was, the thing is with these, you know, back to your whole conversation about, you know, the alumni is giving back, man. They're really preying on individuals, you know, tribal instincts. They want you to feel like you have this tribal deep connection and they want you to stay connected. And this is the thing that you care about. That's the one thing I never personally ever got into college football. And I know that a huge segment of the population is really into it. And oh, I'm yeah. like, I ask people, like, I, I know Odun used to be into it for a little bit. And I know some of his college buddies are into it. You know, you, I would think that you guys, of all fucking people, your sports, like, knowledge when it comes to basketball, you would be full, like, erect into, like, college sports. See, and that, and that, no, and that's the difference, right? So, like, the NBA, they do such a good job of player development and making the players the face of the league. With, like, something like college football, you know, they're wearing helmets. You don't even know the players, Unless you're a real fan. So for me, I'm always wondering, how is everybody so invested in these guys? You don't even know who they are. Year after year after year, they're changing out these players. You know, there are those people who think that the college sports are more pure, well, at least prior to NIL, were more pure Yeah, because people were doing it for the pure love of the game and the ambition of their dreams. Yeah, but if you if you look at what the amount of recruiting now, man. A lot I of mean, stuttering in that one, bro. I threw you off, huh? No, he man. He knew NIL? Shit. Yeah, I was like, God damn, bro! <laughs> but you think you look at it like some of these players—they get treated terribly, man. Some of the stories you hear, oh, yeah. what, what like Nick Saban does over in Alabama, Odin, right? Yeah, like he'll he'll literally take players on, promise them the world, and then if they just don't perform after a year, he'll kick them to the curb and go find another place to transfer to, bring on the next new hot guy, and you're like, dang, man, this guy—you promised this guy the world, and you're not even giving him any playing time now, and now. It, this is what he's been training for his entire life. I know you're really eager to talk about sports, but let's move on. Oh, jeez, <laughs> Arun, you want to give it to him? I got the, I got the, I got listeners in my DMs telling me I really enjoy the fact that you bring up sports. Yes, you and that listener have a ro romantic like comedy working out. Oh, now who's stuttering? Well, because I didn't want to say his boyfriend because that'd be insulting to the listener. But I want, I, want, I mean, let, let, you and your friend. I hope you guys enjoy your sports talk. This is a financial literacy podcast. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. You were so happy. I wanted to take that to you and give it to you and take it right away. Got it. Got it. It's mine. All right. You can't have that sports talk. Okay. No. Should we talk about Miami now? Let's do it. Not sports. Not the Dolphins. Go Fins. Oh, the fact that you knew that is impressive. Somebody said it to me the day I had to look it up. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was like, oh, I get that now. Yeah. All right. So this is going to be a long quote. And um, I think it's worth it. Saeed thinks it's a little bit of a compelling number. And that it's unrelatable, but we'll see. I think it's really unrelatable, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Miami's rental market roller coaster is headed downhill. Speaking of Miami from the earlier part of the episode, this from the Wall Street Journal. New inventory, a return to office, and a general slowdown from the COVID housing craze are causing prices in the city's luxury sector to drop. So this quote is uh, a little bit of a banger. You ready? Are you, are you ready? You think you got this? Oh, there is no way I get through this without stuttering and fucking this up in some way, shape, or form. Good luck, Chief. After a historic run-up in prices, the luxury rental market in the Miami area is seeing a significant slowdown. Although rents are still generating higher than they were pandemic, generally higher than they were during the pandemic. See, fucked up, number one. <laughs> you want to count them? <laughs> yeah. Over, one. Over, un, over, under, and five? Yeah. Make sure you add the dings to each mistake. <laughs> <laughs> in the audio. <laughs> <laughs> Local real estate agents said the velocity of people moving to Miami has slowed and there are fewer people willing to overpay. The fact that they're even like referring to it as willing to overpay is shocking. Yeah, exactly. Meanwhile, newly built apartments are adding thousands of rental units to the market, further easing the supply demand imbalance that has characterized the market over the past few years. In the Miami luxury market, Defined as the top 10% of the market, nearly all segments are down from pandemic-era peaks, said local real estate agent Anna Boskovic. Bozovic. Bozovic. Mm -hmm. Anna B., whose firm, uh, Analytics Miami, tracks the market. It's number two. 
So, <laughs> I, I, can you imagine? I'm letting I, you roll. I'm not being the bad guy here. I know. I got through law school like this. That's the fucked up part. <laughs> you didn't have to read out loud. It was like my nightmare when they were like, Popcorn Chris. And you're like, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> Chris, tell us about the case. Right, I'm not going to read it. I'm just going to yeah. tell you what I remember. Can I bullshit my way through it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So far this year, the median monthly rent for a luxury three-bedroom house in Miami-Dade County is eight thousand five hundred dollars, down from fifteen down fifteen percent from ten thousand last year. She said, "For condos, the median monthly rent for a luxury three-bedroom is eight thousand two hundred dollars, down eight point nine percent from nine thousand dollars last year." Dude, that's a big drop when you're down fifteen and eight point nine percent respectively. Yeah, man, that's a big drop in rental rates. Mm -hmm. Now, keep in mind these larger rental rates have a lot more room to go down. Overall, Miami's rental market seems to be cooling faster than other cities nationwide, according to the data from listing website Zumper. Have you ever been what that, a, what a name, yeah. Zumper? I went to Zumper yesterday. I got zumped. Yeah, okay. I zumped it. I zumpered it. <laughs> what's the What's the proper way of making that a verb? You know, I, don't, <laughs> like, I googled it. <laughs> I zumped the shit out of it. I mean, what is, <laughs> in September, the median monthly rent for a Miami one-bedroom apartment fell 1.47% to $2,690 for one bedroom. $2,690 from the month before and 1.96% to $2,500 in Miami Beach, Zumper said. Well, why, is there, why would anybody want to pay that much in Miami? What's going on in Miami? Miami Beach? <laughs> yeah, I don't understand. What's the draw? You know, as a person who is a happily married man, I have no idea. Right. I don't really get it. Yeah. People want to spend a lot of money to go down there. Yeah, I can't say that I understand the draw at all. I mean, I would. I just want to. I mean, you can live by the beach down here. We got beaches. You could live in Ventura by the beach. Yeah. Why don't you move? <laughs> Chicago has a beach. Is it really? Yeah. Huh. The shootings there? No, man, not that poor. <laughs> it's, it's not a That's south city. side of Chicago. <laughs> By comparison, the median rent for a one-bedroom nationwide grew 0.1% to $1,511 during the same period. The dip is a sharp change from the frenzied pace of the real estate market over the past few years as an influx of people moved to Miami for warm weather and low taxes. Oh, that's what it was. That's what they moved there. Oh, the warm weather. Warm weather and low taxes, which drove up the real estate values to historic levels. Mm. Oh, that makes sense. Because yeah, no income tax there, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, warm weather, low taxes. That's what it is. Yeah. I'm glad we know. Yeah. Now you know. Nightlife is okay too, right? I, I haven't heard. I mean, I, it's rumors. I have bits and pieces. Yeah. I wouldn't know. Right. I think they're, what do they call them? The, uh, the, the clubs? Uh, clubs. Clubs. <laughs> That's what they have there, I think. Christopher, you... Some, some hey, sentiment Now, now you're there. not being honest. You you spent quite a bit of money at those clubs in Miami. Um... I do not recall. <laughs> I recall. <laughs> well, I don't want to hurt your feelings tonight. God, what a beautiful house. Yeah, these are beautiful homes. Yeah, these are for rent? Jesus. Yeah. Some of these people are paying $30,000 a month. All right. Let's get to the charlatan portion of tonight's episode, sponsored by every douchebag you see on social media. <laughs> yeah, man. So uh. this from the real deal, multifamily mentor Brad Sumrock. Built an empire. Now the cracks are showing. What? So this guy is one of those syndicator gurus, oh, read right? This, read, no, read the subtitle, baby. The subtitle? It's even better. Investment guru teaches newbies the ropes of syndication. Now, loan data suggests some deals are struggling, and some rock himself is not immune. You know, you really sound like you're reading whenever you do that. Yeah, I'm trying to be a radio guy. That's not radio. Arun, radio radio Arun, voice. Can you chime in here? Is that radio voice? Yeah, it was radio voice. Really? I didn't get radio voice vibe. I got like See, you I to... am reading an article now. Yeah. Some rock. Well, his tone was going up and down. <laughs> yeah, it was good. Yeah, it wasn't seven I mean, I'm just saying you could do better. Man, you've been you okay? No. He's attacking you today. He's you, you see it? I see it. I'm feeling it I'm too. Coming in fuego, baby. You woke up this morning and chose violence. Yeah. From Miami yeah. to Ibiza. He did. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> I'm gonna remind you about your Miami. <laughs> Club days more Just often. Just read their quote, you fucker. <laughs> You'll see a mad dash of people run to the back of the room to sign up and throw their money at him because they think they're going to get rich. Rune? I was really good. Thank I tried you. to get yeah. it on him, too, but I was muted. Is that why you did the uh, yeah, I apple juice butt I, open thing? Bro, I opened it, and I was like, why didn't I hear that? And I was like, oh, shit. And then you just heard the pop. That's the, the first time you fucked that up. I know. Right. 
So, uh, Brad, I think, I think it killed all of our mojo, frankly. I think that's how the whole vibe of the show's off. See, what? it threw me off because Saeed yeah. was talking. I was like, let me get Saeed for once. And I just, I, I got nervous. And Yeah, your wrist is off, King. <laughs> trauma. Yeah, trauma. Trauma. Yeah, ever since before the show, when you called him out for his outfit. It was very, dude, first of all, you're wearing a flannel shirt. Long sleeve flannel shirt with Nike shorts. Okay. When he wears that flannel, I know he's feeling warm and cozy. He, the, he's trying to get comfortable on the show. He put, then, the, he put the kids down. He came. I could stay out tonight. Adidas socks with Adidas shoes. It's very just. He's it's, a new guy. It's giving trauma. I've worn shoes twice this month. I man. know. Come also off putting for me. I don't know. You're throwing <laughs> off my whole fucking yeah, thing. Yeah. What's man. the deal? What's the deal with that, bro? Why? All of a sudden the change. I don't know. I just thought I'd start wearing shoes. Okay. So this is better than sports talk, you say? Sex talk. <laughs> Sex talk. Got it. So yeah. Brad Summerock, an investor guru who calls himself the apartment king, built an empire of classes on syndication, essentially pooling investor funds to buy apartment buildings. Summerock claims his courses, which feature strobe lights and air horns. Me, 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 me. Can you imagine? I'm Let's gonna, talk about syndication, baby. I'm going to spend ten thousand dollars. I don't even know how much this guy was charging to go over to one of his seminars and be and like, another one. You walk, you walk in, and like. <laughs> Just go have an epileptic seizure because yeah. of the strobe lights. Me, 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 me. Yeah. Has created <laughs> over 600 millionaires is what he says. Yeah, sure. Makes sense. 600 millionaires. Which means, in, in without saying it, he said that he's made $600 million for the people. At least. At least. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for doing math. The level of math there was <laughs> difficult, but I got it. He also attests that he has never lost anyone's money. That sounds really familiar, Chris. Yeah, you, you've never lost anyone's money. That sounds like I've Grant th- Grant Carbone. Car, yeah. car, no, not Carbone. Can, Carbone's a really good restaurant. Candone. Yeah, I wonder. If, can, condone? Grant Condone? No. I don't remember his name. Carbone is a really fancy restaurant in New York, right, that a lot of people enjoy. Is there one out here, too? Uh, I've been to the one in New York. I don't know about the one here. Yeah, have you been? Oh, you've been there. Yeah, I heard a lot of good things about it. Fucking amazing pasta. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. They made it in like the cheese thing in front of you. Mm, they make it in front of you. Yeah, they have like a big cheese, and they put like the pasta warm in it, and then they like mix the thing around the cheese, and the cheese comes off the cheese and melts on it, and then you mm-hmm. put it on a plate. Damn. Yeah, it's fucking amazing. All right, man. So, I mean, what do you got me? What do you got for this guy? Oh, man. Okay, so I went down the daisy uh, chain here and went down the rabbit hole, whatever you want to call here, and um, I took a look at some rock and his douchebag partner, and uh, he called himself the apartment king. Anytime someone labels themselves the king of something, just think bad. Liver king, for example. How'd that work out for him? Yeah, I'm not going to bash LeBron James, but... He didn't label himself that. Other people labeled him that. Did he really? Maybe, okay. I don't think he ever, he ever said, you know what? Fuck it. I want to be known as call King James today. I mean, his he as an 18-year-old, he had chosen one tattooed on his back. Yeah, that doesn't mean that he's the king. I mean, I feel like he's going for it. Okay, I'm trying to help you help yourself here. I'm, just, you're, I'm defending your guy, okay? <laughs> no, it's not my guy. Huh? It's not my guy. It's your guy. See you how love... I brought sports talk back? You, See how I did that? Fuck. See what I did? <laughs> well, for the Real Deal's October cover story, Isabella Farr and Susanna Cavanaugh, looked at this whole thing right now i went to his profile a room cl- click on brad some rocks profile i was stunned to see how little of a following he actually had mm. uh go up go up there you go right there there it is there you go so you go here and look twelve thousand eight hundred followers wow i did not check this out for somebody that's made people 600 people millionaires yeah and of course his link is brad some rock dot com slash masterclass oh uh, yeah i would have thought for sure this guy would have bought himself some more followers yeah right <laughs> like Jeez. i mean I'm, I'm very confused some rock right but all these are obviously the self-indulgent photos of himself with some kind of bullshit quote right mm-hmm. time won't wait for you to or forge your path with the right allies the blueprint for my success the biggest misconceptions real estate make that's not even a fucking full sentence. I didn't read that wrong. That's actually what it says. Right. So the problem with guys like this are right. They if 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 they have if they have a following, and they the following is are hearing people like over at the higher standard say, you know, one one area that we like to invest in is real estate, right? And if mm-hmm. if you can get yourself in that game and learn it, it can be really valuable for you and your family down the road. A good way to pass on wealth, right? And then they stumble across this guy's page and like, oh, this guy says he can make me rich, and they'll just go and invest with him. Right, this so what? What, me so much. what kind of advice do you have for people like that? 
For people like this? No, for the, for the person that would stumble across a person's page like this and is promising them the world. Okay, let, let's just go out on a limb here. What's Brad's background? I mean, I don't, I don't follow. <laughs> I mean, what, what do you think it is? Yeah. Do you think you think he's got some a, a, extensive experience in real estate? Right. No. Mm. I can tell you right now, he doesn't. Want to know why? I've seen his Instagram page. Right. You are not a seasoned professional. You know what you are? You're a person selling courses. Mm. That's what you are. And through your selling of courses, you were able to manipulate some of your, quote, students to give you more money under the context of a syndication. Mm -hmm. Because you promised them they would get a return on their investment. They probably spent so much money on with you and on you, and you probably made it so overcomplicated, probably because you didn't know the fuck you were talking about, that they thought, okay, well, I got some return on my investment. I believe in this guy so much. Let me put money into him. Right. I've now, over the last 11 years, have underwritten a lot of apartment buildings. Mm -hmm. Okay? And... The same type of savvy real estate investors that that I've actually seen their schedule of real estate own. I've seen their balance sheets, the ones that are actually worth as much money as probably this guy says he is, right? Mm -hmm. They have groups of friends that are also making this much money. And if they need investors, they're not coming out and trying to gather more people to help everyone else get rich. If anything, he's trying to limit the amount of risk he has, and he's probably really just collecting a fee, and that's what he's really trying to get paid off of. The savvy real estate investors are just making money for themselves and their friends. They're not bringing Joe Schmo from Instagram over. Well, Arun, you fucking little golden teddy bear, you. He pulled up Brad Sumrock's uh, LinkedIn page. Mm. Let's go down to his first job here. He went to Carnegie Mellon, graduated in 1989. Mm. Got his MBA from the University of Houston, C.T. Bauer College of Business, no judgment, 1996 through 1998. And then he went into a sales account manager for Aspen Technology. Okay. Global account manager for Trade Ranger, an international account manager, whatever the fuck that is. Mm. Doesn't sound real estate investment. And then sometime in January of 2007, during what was the Great Recession, he became the lead consultant slash broker where he enabled people to do what I was able to do, retire in three to eight years by investing in apartments. Okay, dipshit. Let's go with that. You invested in apartments for five years and two months and retired in three to eight years. What? Right. What? <laughs> what? Who, wrote, who wrote that for him? Like, I don't I mean, know. Like... It, it seems as if just the math doesn't, doesn't work, but okay, fine. Lifestyles Unlimited. First of all, that company makes absolutely no sense. I have no idea what it is. And he didn't really elaborate on exactly what he did. He said he was a lead consultant slash broker. So you brought in leads, and then you were also the broker of the business? So you owned a mortgage brokerage? Why does it say mortgage brokerage? What's Lifestyles Unlimited? That doesn't even sound like a real estate firm. Right. It's very confusing. And then somehow he pops up in February of 2012 to present for 11 years and nine months as a mentor author and speaker after he said he retired in three to eight years why the fuck are you a mentor author and speaker if you retired bro right and arun of course pulls up lifestyles unlimited learn real estate investing from top investors and expert and expert wealth educators mm. so basically it looks like it is also an educational platform mm -hmm. it's a workshop it's a workshop so how did this network which has amongst it podcasts and everything else Enable him to retire in three to eight years. Was he the owner? It doesn't say that. And they, it just says that he taught people. Right. That, that, again, these are red flags, man. I, and I'm not making this shit up. This is his LinkedIn profile. Yeah. I specialize, and this is from his new mentor, author, speaker role that he's been doing for the last 12 years, even though he's retired. Seems to be working pretty hard. Uh, where he specializes in helping people retire in just three to eight short years by investing in multifamily real estate apartment complexes. I transfer my 16 plus years of investing experience to my students. Okay, I'm sorry. I just read your resume. You got five years and two months at a lead consultant slash broker gig for an educational company. Where was your 16 plus years of investing experience? Right. <laughs> Did I miss that? I know. And this, and this is the level of due diligence you wish people would take before they go and invest and take his course. I mean, listen, man, I would. why would you want to take a course with someone that has strobe lights and air horns? It gets better. I have been a principal in nearly 4,000 units over the past 16 years. Uh, okay, first of all, principal is an interesting word, not owner. Mm -hmm. So you had some dollar investment, and in, so you were part of somebody else's syndication? 
Mm. So you invested with somebody else over the last 16 years? Okay, that's interesting. Past 16 years, and in 2012, won the Rental Owner of the Year Award from the National Apartment Association. What? <laughs> that's a thing? Uh, Arun, you know what I want you to do, baby. Pull up Rental Owner of the Year Award from the National Apartment Association. Yeah. Because that's interesting. I want to see other winners of this award. <laughs> What is this? 2002 22 National Association of Apartments or whatever. National part the 2002 22 National NAA, whatever. Yeah, let, I, let, I don't, me, let me look it up and I'll get back. Yeah, to that's me. weird. Okay, but let's go on here. Since 2005, I have been mentoring others on how to do what I have done, which was replace my corporate income with income from my apartment investments. Uh, that and do that in just three years. I thought it was you said he did it in three to eight years. Okay, whatever. Mm -hmm. And many uh, of my students are doing the same. Virtually anyone can replace their income and retire their jobs in three to eight years. What is this three to eight years range? Yeah, man. So you're not gonna look like for someone like for someone like Chris. Okay, you you've invested in real estate. You know, yeah. for uh, however many years now. Uh, pretty actively since 2012. Okay, the name of the game should be continue to do your job and continue to invest in real estate. Yeah. Right, and continue to build your wealth over time. It's it's no different than you know if you if you have a weight loss goal and you get to your destination and now you're like I'm that's it I'm done, right? No, the way this game works is you keep playing, right? Well, yeah, and then let's be honest, you didn't retire. Your resume says you retired. You just started making money selling courses on your own as opposed mm -hmm. to working for somebody else's course selling where you worked for these alleged you know three to eight years prior to your retirement. But you haven't retired. You're now, still working. <laughs> It's a very confusing narrative. Now, here's 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 the problem with all this. There is valuable information somewhere deep in what he says he could teach you, which I doubt he's actually teaching you, but he's not the person you should be going to learn this from. I don't have a problem with him even giving courses. Fine. You want to be a teacher? Fine. What I have a problem with is his last job here from June of 2013 to present for 10 years and five months. He's the founder, president of Sumrock Multifamily Mentoring. Mm. And if you recall the article, the former student of Brad Sumrock, let's read this quote from The Real Deal. If you go to the other screen for me, Arun, real quick. Thank you very much. You'll see a mad dash of people run to the back of the room to sign up and throw their money at him because they think they're going to get rich. Man. So where, so the, these types of individuals that really want to learn this space, how would you recommend they go about learning it? If they can't, they don't know which guru to trust now, right? And Therein and for, lies the problem. There are no gurus, and this is not mentorship. Mm -hmm. You don't pay someone else, some asshole, to mentor you. And even my sister and I argue about this shit all the time. Mm -hmm. She pays people, and it fucking burns me. I, I hate it. Yeah. And I'm like, you do know I'm your brother, right? Right. Like, I can help you do this shit. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's a whole thing. Yeah, uh, Arun pulled up the, who screw the awards. Uh, the awards bullshit. Let's be honest. It, it's not an award worth any value, and his quoting is sad. Yeah. Okay, but... He, it, it's so infuriating. I blame guys like Grant Cardone, who was quoted in this article. The other guy quoted this, Neil guy. If you go to the, the article right there on the right, click on his profile, Neil uh, Bawa, mm -hmm. B-A-W-A. He's got a profile on Instagram. They quote him in this article. Look at his followers, 4,475. How how are these guys? Even this guy looks like a serial killer. I'm going to be honest with you. This guy scares the <laughs> shit out of me. I saw his profile. I'm like, ah. He's, he's training people and giving a free course, too. Here's the way real mentorship works. You want to learn about apartment buildings, okay? You go work. With somebody in apartment buildings, if you're young enough. And if you're not young enough and you can't do that because you got other stuff going on, I get that. Mm -hmm. You can get all you need to know about the basics of apartment units by doing some simple things. Get your real estate license, mm -hmm. okay? Then you'll take that and you'll learn from courses online on YouTube for free. I have literally put out an episode with Saeed about multifamily investing, which will give you the core concepts in the language and the vernacular that you can springboard off of. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of people who will teach you for free. Mm-hmm. Okay, there are plenty of places to go for free. You can start investing not in syndications, but in real estate investment trusts. You can start investing in your own real estate, a two, a one to four unit, which is financed like single family, but will give you the experience of getting into multifamily. If you like that, you can grow and scale into bigger businesses. But this is not the way. And sure, you can get a basic premise, and if you don't call them mentors, because that's what they are, you can pay someone like. You know, some rock to, to teach you about apartment lending if you want to. If that's if that's your shortcut, fine. Pay him to do that. Mm. But don't give this guy your money. Don't give it to him in a syndication. Grant Cardone, the guy who was a used car salesman who who got himself some fame and was on a television show 
And I hate him. I don't, I don't like him. I find him unethical, immoral, and all the bad things, and slimy and greasy, and he uses all his flashy bullshit. He's not using his success to get in business. Mm -hmm. He's rubbing the things in your face and make people want to the FOMO lifestyle. Right. Okay, a guy like him, what did he do? He bought a shit ton of real estate in Florida. This has been covered by many, many sources with bridge financing at historical all-time interest rate lows, didn't lock it in because he's betting on upside potential. And I guarantee you he's going to be on, on the list of people that, that, despite the real deal having this weird love affair with him, they will have to call out at some point in time because even though he's getting sued and all these other things, again, we talked about the earlier show, the people with the most money and the most time will win. So it doesn't surprise, surprise me that he's winning. What, what surprises me is the fact that his investors haven't gone, wait a minute. All this bridge financing in place? Because yeah, they don't understand it enough. They don't understand he didn't, it he didn't, enough. He didn't teach that that aspect of it. So actually, this is uh, a valuable point that I wanted to get into. That I just remembered a listener reached out to me and asked. Um, and maybe we could answer it right here on the show now. Because I've only worked the deals from the back end side. Once the deal's already, all the investor money is in, in place. Yeah. And they come in and we try to see if the deal works and the deal makes sense, right? But so for somebody that does want, let's say they don't have the funds to go, they... They've listened to our shows. They realize the value in owning an apartment building. They they understand it. They like whatever the longevity behind it, right? But they're uncertain with how to get into it because they don't have the funds to. And they want to now maybe go purchase a small portion, right? Okay. So like a, a real estate investment trust. Right. But let's say they do get invited to potentially invest in a syndication. Okay. Okay. They get to, they get they they're provided a brokerage. Uh, package, right? It, can they ask for additional information or yes. you know some of the historical operating statements that me, the underwriter, would also look at? And, and if they don't provide that, shouldn't that be a big red flag? So Grant Cardone is on record for not providing a lot of this information to people and being offended when people ask for quote due diligence. And he's got these hyperbole based stories where he just like, fills all sorts of bullshit and then tells you that I, you know, if you don't trust me, I don't want your money. And it's like that's not all trust. Getting an operating statement and a rent roll is what your lender is going to ask for. You have them. Your investors should want to see your pro forma projections on how much you make. And if you don't understand the pro forma projections, guess what? Spoiler alert. You shouldn't be investing with somebody whose financials you don't fully understand. Right. But if they provide you the pro forma projections, right? The pro forma projections is just what they're telling you that they anticipate on making. Yes. Right? It's, it's purely conjecture with some educated guesses in the market. Yeah. Now, we That's know. That's best case scenario. Best case scenario. And again, like we talked about earlier in the show. 18 months ago, the construction in places like Miami and Austin looked a whole hell of a lot different mm -hmm. than what you're getting in today's market because rental rates are going down. And, yeah, it's incrementally in some cases, but in Miami, it wasn't incremental. Right. It's pretty fucking impactful in the high end. Mm -hmm. And for a record here, just for the record, spoiler alert, Grant Cardone bought a shit ton of multifamily in Florida. Right. And if Miami is getting impacted, his other Florida markets are going to get impacted similarly, if not the same as some of those other markets do. Miami, granted, is much more crowded. But here's the bottom line, okay? And I, I, I hate to say this. The multifamily market right now is incredibly fucking slow. Mm -hmm. Now is not the time to be looking to invest in any real estate. Hold cash. Wait. Be patient. Use this time to, number one, hold your cash in a place where you can get 5% return because that's pretty common, okay? 4 to 5% anywhere you want in cash. Mm -hmm. Be ready to invest. Be agile because you got cash. Cash one of the best returning investments in 2022. I think I saw some places that were offering 5.25% right now. Yeah, you can see there's crazy returns right now in the market. That's just a weird market that we're in. That being said, use this time to learn. Mm -hmm. Spend the time to go down the rabbit hole. Go down the, the these paths. Research. Reach out to people. I will put you in contact with, with sites that I think provide value information. Listen to previous podcasts that we offer. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of reputable sources that want nothing from you. And we'll give you the information. Right. This is the time right now to educate yourself over the course of the next, you know, year or so to, you know, position yourself the best way you possibly can. And again, this is not the trash syndicators. There are some wonderful syndicators out there. There are people who've been doing this through decades. Okay. Mm -hmm. And there are people who take on investor money because they believe so much what they're doing that they can do that now. But generally speaking, most successful syndicators that I've talked to, they have one commonality. I did this for myself for so long that I finally felt comfortable opening the doors for other people and not putting their money at risk because I know that I know what I'm doing. Yeah, and those type of people generally already have a long line of people that they can already list. Mm -hmm. They don't need to host a seminar to gather future investors. Yeah, that is not the way this works. People who are deeply rooted in this space. It, it's like if LeBron James said, hey... Um, I want to put together some investors on social media. Here's my link. Click and let me know if you want to contribute. 
why the fuck does LeBron James need you? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> he could call up Kevin Hart and be like, yo, Kevin, put some money into this. And Kevin's going to be like, all right, James. Uh-huh. No, no problem, bro. No problem. I got you. <laughs> no. Oh, no. <laughs> That's the way he talks. Wow, that was weird. Yeah. That was really good. Room, was that weird for you, too? That was weird. All right. And just to cap this <laughs> so whole syndication his, thing. He was parrot? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was weird. He's just facts. No cap. Facts. Okay. I'm here. Um, DJ Envy in New York. Oh, man. Just got hit, and uh, Baller Buster and a couple other pages have really started re- re-spreading this information. But again, another, quote, social media real estate guru, and I, it, his name doesn't bear repeating, uh, was trying to syndicate. Again, mm-hmm. this is a very, very common methodology for new up-and-coming, quote, real estate professionals with a social media presence to try to, like, peacock in front of you and get you to invest in them. And this is not... This is... Look, this is not a racial thing, a demographic thing. This is across the board. Right. I've seen African-American guys do this. I've seen white guys do this. I've seen Asian guys do this. And they all play to their cultural groups. So whoever buys into their mantra, who identifies with them. I've seen guys use religion to get people to, to invest in this. I've seen, I mean, in Scientology with Grant Cardone. I've seen people use their ethnicity. I've seen people use their communities so don't think just because that person looks like you or resonates with you for some way or reason that they're going to be honest and forthright. In the case of DJ Envy, you saw a lot of people in New Jersey, in New York, where a lot of his listener base was for his radio show, believe in him. And they said to NBC News, who did a full investigative journalism report on this, that I only invested because of DJ Envy's that's endorsement. The, that's the part I was going to bring up, right? They've been around, I just looked it up right now, since 2010. That's the, the Breakfast Club is a morning show out in out in New York. Yeah. Okay. People listen. People, hardworking blue collar people, are listening to him and not just him, but Charlemagne and Angela Yee. Right. For since 2010, he's gained that trust. Yeah. In that community. So if there was somebody like you know that had evil intentions, yeah. Who can I who can I pair up with that has gained the trust of? Thousands and thousands of people. Oh, I know DJ Envy. And let me just say, this is a reoccurring common theme. This, I don't know why people don't see it more clearly. SBF use fucking Tom Brady and countless other celebrities. Yeah. Okay. Let me attach my message to somebody with fame and credibility mm-hmm. to sell my brand. And this goes back generations and generations. That's why you see older retired actors lending their voice. But it used to be that their voice carried some value. Now it's just a, it's a payday for them. Mm-hmm. So this guy finds DJ Envy. They, they strike up some relationship, clearly some monetary gain for DJ Envy in this whole thing. He lends his audience, and they leverage it to, to weaponize it. This guy is no different. You know, some rock is no different. All these people are the same. Grant Cardone, how many celebrities has he brought on board? Snoop Dogg has been to his conferences. I mean, uh, I mean, you name it. They've all attached themselves in some way or shape or form. And you see these other places. What's that girl, uh, Bobby, whatever the hell her name is, who did all those podcasts that are really awkward? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot her last Alt-off name. Alt-Off or whatever uh, The one is. that did it with Drake, and then they took it down. She, she attached it with Drake. She launches her celebrity status, and she's got uh, the owner of the Dallas Mavericks on. Yeah, Mark, Mark Cuban. Cuban. I think she was she, doing it with Scarlett Johansson, she, too. She's got little Yachi and all these people. Like, And these people, this is I'm all sorry, a byproduct. Hold on, hold on. Yachi? 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 What is it? Yachty. Little Yachty. Is that what it is? Yeah, man. It's not a proper boat? <laughs> little Yachty. Little Yachty? L- little Yach? <laughs> Damn. I, Even I'm I sorry. knew that. Okay, well, you're the pop culture guy. You're supposed to know that. <laughs> Arun knowing is, is, hey, is uh, normal. You knowing it's weird. Can I be honest with you? I love you, I love you more for not knowing it. How about that? <laughs> I, I honestly, dude, some of these rappers are so fucking bad. Although yeah. I will say with his interview with her, he was like fucking with her back. Oh, oh, he was good. No, apparently someone else that's been fucking with him back is uh, not Quavo, but the other remaining uh, Migos member. Apparently he was giving it to her and she was like stumbling. She was breaking character mid-interview because he was like fucking with her so hard. I don't understand why people like watching the interviews. They're very like... Because it's so... It's cringe, man. When I hear... when I, The first one that I watched with her, I was like, come on, don't do this. And I had, I, I had to turn okay. it off. So Zach Galifianakis can sell that between two ferns. Yes, like, he's good. That's cringe, but it's it's brilliant acting. Yes. She, as much as she might be acting, there's no longevity in that. Like, there's th- this 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 only goes so far before people are like, eh, I don't care. It's, yeah, it's just a gimmick, right? Yeah, yeah it's yeah. a gimmick. Even Between Two Ferns didn't last forever. Yeah. 
I wish it did. Yeah, the one Brad Pitt where he spit gum in his mouth. <laughs> I was like, Jesus. <laughs> Great, man. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, let, let's uh, let's call it a wrap room. Did you have any uh, more Mott's apple juice you want to open up your ass before the show's over? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm good. Yeah, well, well, were you ever a Snapple guy, Odun? Yeah. Really? Yeah. That doesn't surprise me. What flavor? For sure, the raspberry tea. Oh man, he was a big ras. Good call, man. Yeah, for sure, oh, he was a really he was a big <laughs> raspberry iced tea guy. Yeah, that was an easy call. Yeah, good shit. Yeah. You do know your friends. I, I do know you guys. Yeah, all right, intimately. <laughs> yeah, with your poofy hair. Why? You, why are you so focused on this poof thing? This is the third time you said poof to me tonight. <laughs> you you were aiming. That's what you were going for. You yeah, look, you did I, that intentionally. I you it's could, a mullet. After I told you it was poofy, you could have adjusted it, and you chose not to. First of all, I have I have headphones on. <laughs> yeah. It accentuates the poof. <laughs> Even more reason. And if you if you care to see what I'm talking about, make sure you I hope you tuned into the YouTube episode. Go over to YouTube, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, ring that notification bell, do all the sexy good good. And if you haven't, go over to Apple or Spotify and leave us an honest five star review. So you're saying you do like the hair? Yeah, man, I like the hair. That make you feel better. You told Arun he needed to get a haircut too. You've been very hair critical tonight. Chris, oh, I always need a haircut though. Yeah, he's Chris. What? Chris. <laughs> Choose words carefully here, Chief. Christopher. I'm gonna Let's leave say. it. I'm gonna leave it right there. Say what? What's, what's wrong with my hair? <laughs> no, it's nothing wrong with your hair. It's a little bit long. You were clowning your hair yourself. You said something about the guy who cut it didn't do a good enough job. I don't know what the was guy? it. The what guy you, that cut it. What you said he left it long on the back. What'd no, I say? said I had a mullet on purpose. On purpose? Yeah. That's done intentionally? Yes. What's Okay, first of all, what's wrong with my hair? It's too long on the back, man. That's the point, man. What what's the It's a mullet. Have you not seen one? That so that's what you're going for. You're going for the mullet look. I'm going for anything that says, "Hey, I actually have hair now and I want to let it free." Okay. I can, I didn't have the option of having a poof before, asshole. Oh, okay, because you got a convertible on the way or something, so you wanted to let it flow a little bit. I don't have a convertible on the way. I got a Rivian on the way. Oh, okay. Arun, that's unnecessary. You could do that. That that that's that's hurtful. <laughs> that's actually not a bad look. But the, the guy with the real mullet. You want that guy right there Which on the guy? bottom. No, down Odin to the right. To the sorry, to the right down. He hasn't figured out to the right yet. To the right. Right. Okay. Right there. He wants that one. That's what you want right there. I don't want that. Yes, that's what you're going for. No, I want more I mean, something he more. Wishes he had that. No, I want something more <laughs> mohawky than that. More mohawky? Yeah. That's that's a good look for you. Look, you just because you're being negative, bro. Like, first I'm not of all, being negative. I'm trend setting over here, my guy. Yeah. <laughs> my guy. Just wait. When you see everybody walking around with this like Mohawk mullet thing in a couple of years, you're gonna be like, fuck, Chris did that. You know, actually, I'm impressed. Usually by now. <laughs> oh, here's a couple of this. <laughs> usually by now, you've switched it up. You you've hung on to this one for quite a quite some time. You've gone through multiple variations of like hairstyles, and you've committed to this one. And by the, for that, I say yeah, because good job. unlike you, I don't care about whether or not you don't. Care. I'm not. I'm not as vain as you are. Stop. <laughs> that, I don't need this. That's like, why you're constantly con switching it up. Because because, you con because I don't care about somebody else's perception of my aesthetic. That's not true. I know I look ridiculous, and I'm okay with that. You don't look really. You look, it looks really good. See, that's being hurtful. <laughs> right now, your facetious when it's not poofy, when it's slick back. Yeah, you keep saying poofy like I'm offended by that shit. I'm okay about it. He's calling fucking, you poofy, not yeah, your hair. glorified powder poof poof girl, whatever the hell it is. It's fine. <laughs> I'm looking care. a little poofy. I'm in just that doing shirt, this. It's, it's, it's entertainment for the show. It does look really good. Yeah, I, I was very for those of you listening to the show and for those of you watching it. Uh, I came to a really bitter realization based on an anecdotal conversation prior to the show. And we'll take you out with this so you can end the misery. But um, I realized that Larry Wheels is buff and fucking in incredible shape as he is, weighs about 240-something pounds. And I'm approximately 16 pounds heavier than him. And you are three inches taller than him. Yeah. It's just when, you, when Arun saw him, he was like, that's the biggest human I've ever seen. Yeah. And he realized that I'm bigger, not muscular, but just overall weight in aggregate. Yeah. That's sad. I feel... And I feel That's what he's supposed to do for I a I feel living. large. No, you're fine, man. Get over it. Wow, that's that's not acknowledging my feelings at all. My feelings at all. You look great, man. That seemed insincere. Rune, you look fantastic, though. Thank you, man. You've lost a considerable amount of weight. And I Honestly, tell you, I lost another five pounds this week. Good for this guy. 
You lost Why do you hair? keep adding them? Wait, bro, <laughs> what, according what? to you, I'm like 190 now. <laughs> yeah, don't be. My mom is almost fucking. My mom is. My mom's lost like 80 pounds. Really? Oh, damn. Oh, yeah. Good for her, man. Dude, she's. I think she's below 190 now. Good, man. Yeah, she's. She's. It's incredible. Yeah. yeah. She got some more. Has she got her? some. No, she got some more blood work done. It's just things starting to get stabilized a little bit. Yeah, dude, her resting heart rate's like in the like high sixties now. How does she feel? When you were obese before, it's great. Yeah, she feels great. She's she was putting on, she's putting on clothes. She's got like the flappy skin stuff going on though. Yeah, I know that's probably uncomfortable for her. But does she feel better? Like more energy? Oh yeah, oh yeah. That's good, man. Mobility just in and of itself is like astonishing. It's like opening up a new world. It's crazy to see how far we as humans are willing to tolerate shit because you just gradually get there over time. Mm. You know. I imagine that's what you feel like sometimes. What was that supposed to mean? That you actually got sucked into this podcast with me as an asshole. And, you fucking <laughs> and you're like, how the fuck did I agree to this shit? That's a story for another day, people. Yeah. Nope. Call it, right. friendo. Anything, oh, dude? Nope. All right. Last chance for uh, Mott's apple juice butt opening. No? Oops. No. Nothing. All right. Mott's apple juice. That's the most. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Bye.